When Ann McDonald gets up in the morning, she unloads the dishwasher, then lays back down in bed. A task that for many of us seems so small brings her to the point of exhaustion. After resting, McDonald will read the paper and challenge herself with a crossword puzzle. But even that comes at a cost. The fatigue forces her back into bed. Though this routine is now part of McDonald's everyday life, it wasn't always this way. In fact, just five years ago, she'd been a healthy 52-year-old oncology nurse, training to hike the highest peak in North America. Seemingly out of the blue, she was struck down by a mysterious illness that left her so debilitated and fatigued she could barely move for days. Her doctor said she was simply dehydrated, but McDonald's symptoms persisted, even as all her blood tests came back normal. She spent the next two years searching for answers. I saw my primary care doctor, I saw a psychiatrist, endocrinologist, rheumatologist, neurologist, and none of them could explain my symptoms. And really, I just got a blank look from my primary care doctor. McDonald and her husband, who's a physician, landed on the diagnosis, myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome, or ME-CFS. A visit to the Bateman Horn Center, which specializes in treating ME-CFS patients, confirmed their hunch. There really are some outdated ideas about what chronic fatigue syndrome is, which is one of the reasons we're linking it to the older, more technical name. And so I usually tell people, forget everything you thought about chronic fatigue syndrome before now. We think this is a mostly a post-infectious illness and very often a post-viral illness. And think about, usually it's diagnosed many years down the road from the onset. So some of the information is lost in the process. But it is a chronic, complex, and debilitating illness that affects many systems of the body. That's Dr. Lucinda Bateman, the founder and medical director of the Bateman Horn Center. She's an expert in the diagnosis and treatment of ME-CFS and one of the few specialists in America. Myalgic is a term that means muscle pain, encephalo is brain, and myelitis is spinal cord. This is a physiologic illness. It affects the central nervous system, and it's your brain, and the peripheral nervous system, especially the autonomic nervous system, but it affects the way your immune system functions and the way your blood circulates to the organs, and there may even be a problem with the production of energy within cells, like cells aren't able to make enough ATP, which is what cells use to do their jobs. Bateman says researchers haven't found any biomarkers for chronic fatigue syndrome, so traditional diagnosing methods like blood tests and CAT scans are useless. This lack of visibility has left many physicians skeptical of ME-CFS patients, saying it's all in their heads. However, in 2015, Bateman and her colleagues were able to create a clinical diagnosis for chronic fatigue syndrome. Today, they teach physicians around the world how to see the signs of ME-CFS without using the traditional testing methods. It's a combination of impaired function, low stamina, low energy, relapse of the illness symptoms from trying to do more, sleep problems, cognitive complaints, and a unique problem called orthostatic intolerance. And orthostatic intolerance means that being upright, even sitting in a chair with your feet on the floor, but certainly standing, is poorly tolerated because of some problems with circulation. And they're kind of invisible problems because we're in a hurry in the medical system and we just put a stethoscope on someone and draw their blood and do typical tests. And the routine tests we do in medicine don't really elicit this illness very well. Bateman says the symptoms must be present for at least six months before making a diagnosis because some patients will get better within that time. And though there's no cure for the illness, there are a variety of treatment options available. The first and foremost is learning not to create post-exertional malaise. Don't do the kinds of activities that lead to illness worsening. And we can give people support for disordered sleep, for pain, particularly for orthostatic intolerance, which has to be kind of assessed and documented. But there are many well-established medical interventions for people with orthostatic intolerance. So, you know, really many features of illness, including allergic features, 
can be treated and modified and improve the chance that people will be able to gradually improve their function and be able to manage their illness, even if it remains chronic. And though we live in a fast-paced world where we expect medicine and treatments to make us better in a matter of days, McDonald says MECFS demands more time. It is a very slow process, and it's a series of ups and downs. It's kind of a roller coaster. Sometimes you feel better, and sometimes you feel worse. And honestly, with MECFS, time is measured in months and years in terms of getting better not in days or weeks. One of the hallmark symptoms of this disease is exercise intolerance. Though it can improve for some, most patients with ME-CFS are prohibited from working out because it can cause you to crash and further worsen your illness. Sometimes people get in what we call a push crash pattern because they're really trying to, you know, get back to their function, but it comes back to bite them and they crash and have much worsening illness symptoms. Having to adopt a lifestyle that includes plenty of rest and no exercise might sound like heaven to some, but MECFS patients say it's absolute torture. McDonald says that being an oncology nurse was part of her identity, and she was devastated when she was forced to give it up. And since chronic fatigue syndrome just gets worse the more you try to fight it, McDonald spent the last few years working to embrace her new normal. I have learned to accept that this is what has happened to me and that fighting it will not help me. In fact, fighting it only makes it worse. So that is it. I have also gotten to know other ME CFS patients on the internet. That is, the internet has been a lifesaver for me because I know other people who are suffering from the same illness that I am. And when we get on Zoom calls, I can see them and I can see that they're laying in bed just like I am. And that's incredibly reassuring. The CDC estimates that one million Americans have MECFS. Bateman says that nearly 25 percent of them will be completely bedbound or housebound at some point during their illness. A majority of patients are unable to work or attend school, including many teenagers who may develop chronic fatigue syndrome after having had mononucleosis, a disease caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. Bateman says this disease can be a huge burden on parents and caregivers. I know mothers, for example, who quit their career and stayed home to manage the illness of their teenager. It is a big job. If you're an adult male with this illness, it's devastating for families if you were the income generator. And people go through stages of grief when they get this illness. And it's compounded by the fact that they may not be believed by their employers or by their family members or friends. And that is emotionally devastating to have all of the things you care about or many of them taken away and then not be recognized. And it's even worse, of course, if doctors don't have the ability to recognize the disease and are dismissive. However, more doctors have begun to change their attitudes towards MECFS due to the emergence of long COVID, which mirrors chronic fatigue syndrome. According to the CDC, 7.5% of COVID patients will develop long COVID with symptoms that last up to three months or longer. The National Institutes of Health estimates that 20% of these long haulers will hit the six-month mark and then be diagnosed with MECFS. For that reason, the illness is garnering more attention and greater respect from doctors who were previously skeptical of it. Dr. Walter Koroshetz is the director of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke at NIH. He says that scientists haven't been able to figure out which virus triggers MECFS in patients. However, since long COVID has affected so many people at once, researchers have been able to start uncovering the mystery. So if you think about MECFS as a post-viral syndrome, long COVID is a post-viral syndrome, they're still both of them mysterious but they look very similar. So one possibility is that they're going to have a common mechanism. And that would be fantastic for MECFS to finally get at what that is. Koroshet says it's either a factor in the virus or the human, but researchers are still trying to figure it out. And though we may not have all the answers just yet, Bateman's happy MECFS patients are finally being properly recognized by medical professionals. There's absolutely no question about this illness being a physiologic illness and a real disease. 
that we have to learn about. And it's just never appropriate to dismiss another person's suffering when you judge from the outside without really understanding about the illness or about how it's impacting their lives. You can find more information about Ann McDonald, Dr. Lucinda Bateman, and Dr. Walter Koroshetz on our website, radiohealthjournal.org. Our writer-producer this week is Polly Hansen. Our lead producer is Kristen Farrah. I'm Reed Pence. Coming up next week on Radio Health Journal. We're kind of taught to always help others and never to think about yourself. And I think that's terrible advice. Why being selfish is sometimes your healthiest option. Then getting stuck in a crowd is more dangerous than you may think. The density of the crowd gets so high that you can't inhale, you can't take a breath. And so the casualties and crushes are often by asphyxiation because people just can't breathe. All that and more on Radio Health Journal. I'm Nancy Benson, host of Radio Health Journal. If you enjoy listening to Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show, Viewpoints, which covers a wide array of topics from education to history to the environment. Here's a preview of what they're covering this week on Viewpoints. Amazon seems totally invincible. I think, you know, last year Facebook seemed totally invincible, and then it went all meta on us and seems highly invincible at this point. Exploring the decline of another seemingly invincible company, General Electric. Then... The waitress will bring this big slab of cream pie to the table, and just like you look to the table next to you, and you look over and say, I want a piece of that. You're going to need to grab a piece of pie after this story. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in-depth this week on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Listen to Viewpoints on your favorite radio station and subscribe and listen to shows anytime on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. And that's Radio Health Journal for this week. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more. And check Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify for a library of past programs. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and information about our guests at RadioHealthJournal.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Radio Health Journal.